Tonight, we're still waiting for the results of a state ethics investigation into Oregon First Lady Sylvia Hayes. And since snapshots of her life have become center stage in Oregon politics, our Dan Telkin is digging deeper tonight, taking an in-depth look to get kind of a more complete picture of the governor's fiance. What did you find? Well, it's very important to understand that when Sylvia Hayes goes around the country to influence policymakers, she makes the struggles of her early life central to her speeches. She leaves out a lot of details, which an old friend says are important to understanding all she's overcome. I was raised up in really rough, like kind of almost little house on the prairie type rough. Whether it was at Oregon State University. We lived for a time in a little shack. Or at this poverty summit. No heat, no running water, no electricity. At PSU and in Boston, at this conference on the economy and environment, the First Lady of Oregon tells of a tough childhood. My mom left her first husband for his younger brother, and they had to get the hell out of Dodge. That's how I was born in the Northwest. This is the small house she grew up in east of Seattle. It was renovated by her father, who is now deceased. Over time, uh, mental illness and alcoholism took its toll on my parents, and I wound up on my own at 16. Her best friend from high school said that her dad was an SOB. Mm -hmm. Janae Bayan says she met Sylvia Hayes in the late 1980s. Both worked for the county road department near Seattle. And that is where Hayes learned to drive heavy equipment. We were like really close. I kind of mentored her through her whole, you know, county experience and school experience as much as anybody can mentor her. She's strong, you know, that girl is strong and resilient and dedicated and passionate. It is Janae who in Hayes' master's thesis about a lake in Siberia is the first person Hayes says she's grateful to for help in financing Sylvia's trip to Russia that she took with her then boyfriend, Carl Topinka. The couple, seen here in pictures obtained exclusively by the Mail Online. In the acknowledgments, Hayes also thanks the Abraham family for financing the 1997 trip. It is a teenager named Abraham who Hayes apologized last month for illegally marrying as her third husband for $5,000, so she says she could buy a computer and he could get his green card. John Kitzar would deserve to know the history of the person he was forming a relationship with. Janae says she is the one who introduced Sylvia to Abraham and the idea of marriage. Sylvia may have made some mistakes. The Abraham thing was like, you know, I wish that hadn't happened, but it did. She didn't do that with malice, and I know that, you know. And she didn't do that out of greed and desperation either. She did it to help him and help her too. It was just months later when Sylvia Hayes and Carl Topinka bought the remote piece of property in Okanagan near the Canadian border. Sylvia came to me and said, oh, I found the most beautiful property. I would love to go there and write my thesis. The down payment was $15,000. Sylvia Hayes told me I was never financially involved with it. I did not pay any part of the down payment or mortgage payments. Janae says she loaned Sylvia Hayes that $15,000 and is yet to be paid back. Hayes admitted to me that property was intended to be the site of a marijuana grow operation that never materialized. She went over there to do her thesis. She didn't go over there to grow any marijuana. Evidently, that was Carl's way of, of um, paying for his share of the property. Mm -hmm. But she admitted being involved in it. She knew about it after it happened. You know, he brought it in. She knew about it then. That was part of the problem. Mm -hmm. That was probably, you know, just as much of an issue as her ignoring him. In speeches, Sylvia Hayes doesn't talk about her relationship with Carl Topinka or how it deteriorated. She jumps ahead in time. Nearly 20 years ago, I set out to make my home and really build my career in Oregon. I had very little money at that time, and I was literally living out of my car with my two dogs, and I uh, set my tent up on BLM land out near Redmond. But Janae says she was there when Hayes' life in Okanagan and relationship unraveled. She says the women went together to retrieve Hayes' belongings in what was a flurry of life-changing moments. He ended up burning everything that she owned. Carl stood us off with a shotgun. 
He was firing a shotgun. He wouldn't let us near the place. We just turned around and left. 911, what are you reporting? It was days or weeks later. I heard this lady yelling for help. 1998. And then a male started yelling, call the police. Eight neighbors in a Seattle suburb called 911. What? 911, what are you reporting? Um, someone across the street from us is screaming for help right now. The court documents say Sylvia Hayes had gone to Carl Topinka's new residence to deliver this note. She had a stun gun for protection. Hayes wrote, I hope your life is moving in a positive direction, declaring their relationship over and asking to get her computer back, containing her master's thesis. Well, Topinka called 911 himself after taking this stun gun away and broke it when he hit Hayes with it. 911, what are you reporting? Oh, I just broke into my house. I had to hit her a couple times. Is she still there? No, yeah, she ran across the street. She's calling the police on me. Court records show Hayes' bruised arm, choke marks, and a deep cut on her forehead. Oh, my God. What? What? She, what, what? She, oh, I think she needs an ambulance, too. She's really bleeding out of her head. In the court file, statements and letters from Topinka's friends said Sylvia Hayes had concerning behavior before the assault. One friend said, Sylvia followed him home and yelled, now I know where you live. I can get you anytime I want to. The friend said, Carl isn't a saint, but if anything, she stalked him. Another friend wrote the judge, I know firsthand the fear Carl felt during the period Sylvia was harassing him. But detectives and the prosecutor didn't believe Topinka or his friends, and Hayes' injuries spoke for themselves. Topinka pled guilty to domestic violence and spent 12 days in jail. I was associating with the wrong people. It was a brutal turning point. Hayes went on to stake out a new life in Bend. She fought hard to create her company and ran unsuccessfully for state legislature. It's that dip into politics that led to her meeting her future fiance, the governor of Oregon. I have got established here. I met the man of my life and I became first lady. <laughs> That's been quite a journey. I'm not saying everything Sylvie's done is golden and that she's like, you know, the golden calf child. She's a human being and she worked her butt off to get where she is. She did. And yet, got to give her that. Both Sylvia Hayes and Carl Topinka have declined to do interviews. Now, the Oregon Ethics Commission has until February 26th to either dismiss the case or open an official ethics investigation. Now, you say after a lot of these talks, she'll say something like, I'm going to write a book. She's, Is she? She says a book will probably be written about this someday. And, Dan, one thing I want to clear up, I, I want to make sure we have this clear. The friend you talked with is owed $15,000 from Sylvia Hayes that she's never received? That's what she says. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for that.